Throughout history, people have died in some nasty and vomit-inducing ways. Some cases are a matter of bad luck, like the guy whose car fell into a pit, but he climbed out of it several hours later, bruised and hurt, only to be hit by a bus on the road above. Yeah, that really happened. And then, other cases make you rethink your stance on humanity. They urge you to consider just how sick we are as a species. Long point short, people have died in some frightfully fun and marvelous ways. We know because we have compiled a whole list. And spoiler alert, Jesus was just the beginning. So, without further ado, we dive into the most horrific deaths in history. Heraclitus Heraclitus was a funny old chap. You've probably heard that no one steps in the same river twice. Heraclitus said that. He also said other cryptic things like, the way down is the way up, or the only constant is change. Like I said, funny old chap. By the end of his life, he had retreated to the mountains. It was probably a misanthropic bid on his part, but it isn't unlikely that other people simply shoot him away. It wouldn't come as a surprise. Have you listened to how the fella talked? In any case, he was suffering from dropsy, now called edemia, an excess of liquid in cavities. When physicians tried to treat him, he gave them a riddle in typical Heraclitus fashion. Can you produce a drought after wet weather? The baffled physicians urged him to leave their collective sites. As a last resort, he took matters into his own hands. He started treatment by covering himself in cow dung. You heard that right. He was rolling around in that yummy goo. According to Diogenes Lartius, not to be confused with Diogenes the Madman, he sunk into goo, kind of how one gets sucked into quicksand, and then dogs ate him. Did not see that dog bit coming, did you? Mithridates the Soldier Let's start with two important notes. Number one, Mithridates the Soldier should not be confused with Mithridates the Sixth Eupator, the subject of Racine's play. Number two, this story comes to us from Plutarch, who was known to play hard and fast with facts or fast and loose, whichever is more adventurous. Plutarch tells the tale of a soldier called Mithridates who killed Cyrus the Younger, the brother of Artaxerxes II, the king of the kings of the Achaemenid Empire. Artaxerxes was furious. Um, not really. He commended Mithridates for killing his brother because Cyrus wanted to usurp his throne. The king wanted to keep the assassination private, but the soldier went into a drunken rage and spilled the beans. The cat was out of the bag, and Mithridates' insides were about to share the same fate. I'll let Plutarch tell you what happened next. Mithridates should be put to death in boats, which execution is after the following manner. Taking two boats framed exactly to fit and answer each other, they lie down in one of them the male factor that suffers upon his back then covering it with the other, and so setting them together that the head, hands, and feet of him are left outside, and the rest of his body lies shut up within. They offer him food, and if he refuse to eat, they force him to do it by pricking his eyes. Then, after he has eaten, they drench him with a mixture of milk and honey. Milk and honey made the poor fellow attract bees and flies as he vomited and defecated. The creatures followed the milk and honey to the, um, orifices, and continued to devour the insides. Mithridates expired after 17 days. People think Julian Assange has it bad for spilling the truth. At least he isn't spilling his small intestines. Queen Brunhild If you're familiar with Richard Wagner's epic opera, Nibelungenlied, then you know Brunhild. That character was based on an actual European figure, Brunhild, the Queen of Austrasia and Burgundy, who died in a most filthy manner. She had an intense rivalry with Friedgund, who had her sister and husband murdered. The tale of the queen's life and the circumstances that led to her death are far too long to narrate here. To cut a long story short, the constant scheming from both ends led to Friedgen's demise. Her son Clothar II defeated Brunhild's army and captured her. Her hair was tied to a horse's tail, and she was publicly humiliated as it dragged her through the mud. But this wasn't enough. Three more horses joined the action. One horse already had her head, so two were tied to her legs with ropes, and one was tied to an arm. The horses galloped in different directions, dismembering her in the process. Quartering, literally dividing the body into four parts, was a common form of capital punishment in the Middle Ages, or as I like to call them, fun times. Jan van Leiden and his mates It's more than likely that you haven't heard of the Monster Rebellion of the 16th century. A Protestant movement called the Anabaptist Movement wanted to establish a communal government in Munster, Germany. Germany was still going through the aftershocks of the Lutheran schism, and you could notice that in Munster, a city with plenty of Lutherans. 
The Anabaptists seized the city for a while, but the party did not last long. So, when the progenitors of the rebellion were caught, a most befouled fate awaited them. The expelled bishop and his jolly friends seized the city and captured the rebellion's leaders. They had already taken care of the original leader of the Anabaptists, Mathis. His face could be seen atop a pike, and his testicles were the envy of everyone who passed the city doors. In other words, they were nailed to the city door. The successive ruler of the Anabaptists, Jan van Leiden, and his fellows, most notably Bernard Krechting and Bernard Nipperdoling, and yes, that is an actual name, did not have it easy either. Their skins were peeled with hot tongs, and then a dagger each was dispatched into their hearts. Ouchie! And kids these days talk about getting their feelings hurt. Their bodies were then hung in cages, suspended from the St. Lambert Church's steeple. Not very saintly, but hey, that's just me. Al-Mustasim, the last Abbasid Caliph During the Golden Age of Islam, Baghdad was one of the finest cities in history and the envy of the medieval world. People sat under long arches and discussed arts, science, and philosophy. And one day, out of nowhere, arrived the peace-loving Mongols. What a friendly bunch that was! The Mongol leader, Hulagu Khan, asked the Abbasid Caliph Al-Mustazim for surrender, which he rejected by saying something along the lines of, You're a boy, stay in your lane. He did not know that this was no ordinary boy, but a combination of Stalin and Ted Bundy. He attacked and razed Baghdad, one of the most splendid cities on earth, and when he had looted and pillaged the whole city, he turned his attention to the Caliph. The Mongols believed that whoever spilled royal blood on earth would be denied heaven and gifts and toffees and all that crap. So he rolled him up on a carpet and had his horses trample upon him. The blood was not spilled on earth. Even if it was, who would notice it in a desert? The Caliph died slowly inside his wrapped carpet after the Mongols left. George Dodza We've talked a lot about the deaths that happened around the Mediterranean. So, now let's head to Eastern Europe, since they have quite a reputation for hospitality. Georgi Dodzer leads a peasant's revolt against the nobility. But, like all revolts, the revolutionaries either hang the aristocrats or get hung themselves. And since we're talking about Georgi Dodzer, you know he belonged to the latter. He was made to sit on a heated iron throne with a scepter as a mocking gesture. Wanted to be king? Have at it! The torturers tore off pieces of his skin with pliers and invited the other rebels to bite the mark spots. To cannibal or not to cannibal, as Shakespeare put it. Whoever refused was added to Team A, the team that gets eaten. A Team B emerged pretty quickly upon this prompt and ate the first team. With no Team A left, Team B won by forfeit and was let go. However, looking at the broader picture, nobody really won because the Ottomans saw this shit show and decided they could take the effed up region. A few decades later, the Eastern Europeans were back to their old tricks, as evidenced by the torture and execution of Matija Gubek, a Croatian revolutionary. They made him wear a hot crown. Georgie would say, been there, done that. Then he was dragged through the streets and pinched with hot iron pincers. So far, it's a homage to the earlier execution, but they ended it with a flair by quartering him. Jean de Brebeuf and Gabriel Lalmont Let's head to the New World, where we have two missionaries, Jean de Brebeuf and Gabriel Lelmont. The two were converting indigenous groups to Christianity when something sinister happened. The missionaries were attacked and captured by 1,200 people of the Iroquois Confederacy. The captors baptized the preachers with boiling water and applied red-hot hatchets all over their bodies. Then, they sat them on a bark belt and set fire to it. They took off the flesh, roasted it, and ate it before their eyes. During this elaborate hedonism, the missionaries kept making the sign, you know, that hand sign kind of similar to Naruto, and continued their preaching. The natives drank Jean's blood and ate his heart. Ishikawa Guemon Let's talk about the Nippon Robin Hood. He took from the rich and gave to the poor, but he died a horrible death, so don't idealize him. Ishikawa Guemon was a Japanese outlaw and a hero. During the Sengoku period, he failed in his assassination attempt of the daimyo. He was caught and boiled to death. What is so special about that, you might ask? Well, they also boiled his son. Or at least some people think so. He was thrown in the boiling pot with his son, whom he held aloft to protect. Here accounts diverge. According to the slightly optimistic version, the executioners took mercy on the child in light of Ishikawa's heroics and pulled him out. In the other version, which is about to send you spiraling with a case of what the hell, Ishikawa kept his son aloft until he no longer could. Then he drowned him, giving him a quick death 
and cursed at his torches above. A pretty horrific story about an Ultra Pro Max Giga Chat. Grigory Rasputin You know that scene in your average crime serial when the detective says, the victim moved from here to there after being shot. What was he doing? Was he fighting back? Was he trying to send some message? That happened in real life, except the detective did not give a shit about solving the mystery. Since our story is set in Russia, everybody already knew who killed the dude, and the detective would have to be extremely dense if he couldn't enter a peasant and a proclaimed mystic. I don't say self-proclaimed because people of the Russian nobility believed him. His theory of spirituality was based on orgies and uninhibited debauchery. Now, that's the kind of spiritual life I would kill for. Serena Alexandria was in his throes, and through her, he also began experiencing the Tsar's decisions. There were rumors about Rasputin and Alexandria being lovers, but historians consider them largely unfounded. Some aristocrats were sick of him, so one of them, Yusupov, lured him into his house and gave him tea and cakes laden with cyanide. But Rasputin had been a ragamuffin his entire life and had probably developed a high immunity to less than desirable eatables. So, the conspirator offered him wine. The wine had cyanide in it as well. Like a boxer that just wouldn't quit, Rasputin's body kept taking it. He drank glass after glass to no ill effect. Imagine being so annoyed by someone that you wanted to end his life. And he is so annoying that even when you try killing him, you can't. What a selfish bastard. That's probably what Yusupov was going through when he finally pulled out a pistol and sent Rasputin to the Shadow Realm. Or so he thought. Rasputin was the real-life Russian version of a Dark Souls boss. That shit was not easy. The conspirators covered their tracks, but man plans and Rasputin laughs. The spirituality merchant got up, left some more tracks on the floor as he walked, and attacked his killer. A wannabe killer more like. Yusupov fled up the stairs and Rasputin tried to make a run. The conspirators shot him, wrapped his body in a rug, and threw him in a frozen river to avoid any mishaps this time. According to reports, Rasputin's cause of death was… drowning? George Herbert George Herbert, the fifth Earl of Carnarvon, died from a mosquito bite. Seems quite harmless. Not harmless exactly, he did die, more like straightforward. Yet the story of his death is quite eerie once you start hearing all the details. George Herbert had financed the excavation of King Tutankhamun's tomb. Shortly after his death, the speculation fueled by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle about the curse of Tutankhamun captivated audiences around the world. Apparently, the mummy's curse had gotten him. The accounts of his death might have been more fable than fact. But are they? Death shall come on swift wings to him who disturbs the peace of the king, says an inscription near the entrance. Four months and three days after the tomb was opened, George passed away. Here's the twist. When King Tut was uncovered, he had a mark on the exact spot of George's mosquito bite. Mind equals blown. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to have a moment's silence for these people. After all, they died in ridiculous ways just so this video could entertain you psychos. And while you're silent for a minute, leave a comment. Not that we want to hear from you morbid people interested in watching horrible historical deaths, Actually, you know what? Never mind. Don't comment. Let's not turn the comment section into a virtual nuthouse.